Well, hello there, Dr. Richardson with Lecture 10. Today, we're going to talk about evolution. Evolution is a common theme in biology, and the concept of evolution is that how did we get to the planet we have today with all of the different living organisms on our planet. The idea, and you can kind of see maybe from this drawing, you see how they all join together right here. This is the idea of evolution, that we all came from one, one species, one organism. And then over time, with many different changes, and stuff happens, and different types of changes, we have gotten to a point in time where we have millions of different living organisms. We call them species. We're going to find out about that word today. In these lectures, they'll be a little different than the first nine lectures we've had. There's going to be a lot less hard small facts, and a lot more big concepts. So in these lectures, 10 through 15, which are all related, uh, keep an eye out on the slides where you see the asterisks. That's still the information you need to know. But there might be a lot more talking and not a lot of facts. You're also going to notice that based on uh, you know, some of the pictures you see here, which is things that I would draw on the board if we were in a real classroom at this time. So let's uh, get started, actually, with this slide here on the right. Now, we just finished a group of lectures where we learned about the cell and all of the different parts of the cell and how material moves in and out of a cell and how a cell gets its energy. And we finished up with genes. And hopefully you remember, it wasn't that long ago, where we talked about genes. And genes are pieces of DNA. And DNA have this A's and T's and C's and G's, different nucleotides. And a gene is a blueprint to make a protein. We've learned that in past lectures. And to take that concept and pull it into these lectures, let's look at this scenario. So let's pretend this is your common muscle protein. And there it is right there. Now, what happens if one of the nucleotides is mutated. So instead of a C, we now have a T. And we did talk about this also in lectures, in lecture eight and nine. If a gene is mutated, then the protein that that gene is a blueprint for will also be changed. So, you might think of mutations as a bad thing, but what if this is the gene for the same old muscle protein everybody in our species has had for 200,000 years, and then all of a sudden there's a mutation in the muscle protein that allows that muscle to contract with more force meaning that person or animal or whatever can jump higher, run faster, and those are definitely positive outcomes to a mutation, not negative things. So this would be if it was a herd of gazelles, they would be, this would be the one that's out in front running away from the lion that's chasing you across the 
field. So this is a good gene to have. This is a good mutation to have. And that's the idea behind evolution. Gene mutations that result in better genes, better proteins that can allow that organism to stay alive, to run away, to get their food, to reproduce, to pass on those cool gene mutations onto their babies, to, to try and achieve the best that that species can be. So mutations can be a good thing. All right. I'm sorry, I seem to have a problem here with my PowerPoint. Let me open it back up again. Okay. I believe I've shown you this slide before, maybe in lecture one, where you can see that there is a very wide variety of living organisms on the planet. And guess what? Over half of the living organisms on our planet are bugs. I don't know about you, but that's kind of scary to me. We're over here, other animals. And so I show you this slide just so you can kind of open your mind and understand that there are many, many different species. You can see up here, there are 950,000 different species, different types of bugs. And you can see the numbers there of the rest of the types of organisms. So there are almost 200 I'm sorry, 2 million species, different species identified. Uh, but over four and a half billion years that the planet's been around, there may have been as many as 100 million different species that have existed on the planet. And you might want to ask, how did we achieve this diversity, you know, bugs, they all look different. There's the horse and the cow and there's a hot guy there. So, but I mean, everybody's got eyes, right? And everybody's kind of got a head and everybody's got some legs. So how did we get all these different kind of body parts? Well, evolution is a theory in biology that explains how we got to this diversity all the different species and the complexity in living organisms. You know, humans are very complex. 50 trillion cells, I believe, is the right number that all work together. And we can walk and talk and learn and take a test and get an A. That's a very complex organism. So our next number of lectures here is going to talk about evolution today. Uh, the next lecture is speciation. How did we get from one species to uh, two million species? Lecture 12, kind of a history of life. What came first? What came next? Then we're going to talk about populations and communities. And this goes back to those levels of organization of matter that we talked about in our early lectures where we had element and atom and molecule, et cetera, et cetera. And populations and communities are levels of organization of matter where different species are going to be interacting. It gets pretty exciting. Ecosystems we're going to talk about as well and define those. You'll learn what those are. And finally, human impact on the environment. So. Here are the topics of the next lectures. I'll be honest with you, some people don't find these lectures as interesting as the cell lectures or the physiology lectures. But this is a part of biology that we're going to touch on to get you through this course. So as I said, genetic mutations, 
lead to the inheritance of new genes, gene mutations, and they lead to new proteins. And four and a half billion years of genetic mutations over and over and over again, over all of that time, has gotten us to where we are today. Now I'm going to show you a couple of videos. The first one has no talking, just a little bit of music, and it kind of shows our story in one minute. The second one is a little longer, and it's going to show us evolution using a football field so we can see kind of how what's developed over time. So let's take a break and look at a couple of videos. Very stuff. All right, let's get into some of the details of evolution. We'll move through it quickly, but uh, again, in these lectures, I'd like for your mind to just kind of think about it because that's learning science too, is just thinking about, wow, it is so amazing how we got to this point. So maybe you've all seen a picture of an ostrich before, maybe even see one in real life. Really tall birds, right? And they don't fly. Yet there's many other birds that do fly. How is it that there's a bird that cannot fly when all other birds do. Well, that's because ostriches evolved from birds that could fly. But over time, going back to the idea of gene mutations, over time, gene mutations occurred in some birds not all birds, but some birds that led to larger bodies, heavier bodies, because even your genes will dictate what your body looks like. What color is your head? How big, what do your, your feet look like? Are they flippers or are they claws? That's all determined by genes. So the ostrich is a bird who cannot fly that evolved over time because of gene mutations that changed its body. It evolved from birds that could fly. But the idea here in evolution is that these ostriches and the birds that they evolved from have or share a common ancestor. And what that means is sometime, somewhere, back in time, there was the first bird, only one kind of bird from which all others have come from. And this is a picture that we usually show in biology classes to illustrate this idea of a common ancestor the first bird, and millions, billions of years ago, or whatever, there was one type of bird. And then each time something called speciation happens, and we're going to learn about that in lecture 11, but every time enough genetic mutations occur that we now have two different species, then we grow in the number of different bird species that we have. Each split is a new and different species. So again, common ancestor way back in time, the first of its kind, the first bird, the first human, the first lizard, the first snake. But over time, and through a process called speciation, these splits occur, and today we have many different types of birds, lots of variety and complexity. So if somewhere back in time there was a first bird from which all other birds evolved, then there was also farther back in time it stands to reason, a first living organism from which all of us came. 
And that's where we get into the topic of Charles Darwin. You've probably heard of him before. He's considered the father of evolution. And any discussion of evolution must begin with Charles Darwin. And he was a guy from England. He actually, I read, went to medical school and didn't like it and quit. I can relate. Uh, but he decided to join a crew and sail around the world. This was in the early 1800s. And the mission of the ship was to collect scientific data, samples, different living organisms, seeing new life forms, making observations about them, doing science, basically. Now, before Darwin came along, there were, there was only one belief about how everything got here. Just one belief. And in the years just before Darwin came onto the stage, there were a few other guys, they were all men, of course, at the time, who had similar ideas, ideas that were leading in the direction that Darwin would eventually go. So in the 17 and early 1800s, for the most part in this world, no one questions the creationist point of view, creationism which is that God made all living organisms, put us all here, and there have been no changes in the different living things, no changes since the first day. And that's creationism, and that's what the vast majority of people believe. Some still do. It's your right to believe whatever you want. However, Humans are evolving. Those brains are getting, you know, bigger. And a number of men came along just before Darwin that really paved the way for what he would come up with. Linnaeus is a guy who created our naming system. We are Homo sapiens. That's us. And every species known has a name which is great. It's If you're going to be the guy that gives theories about how things evolved, it's a pretty good idea to have names for everything. Buffon and Lamarck, another couple of guys, and they put forth the idea that maybe cr organisms do change over time. Maybe it was not that everything was put here on the first day and nothing changes. Maybe organisms do change over time. They didn't know how. Genes, they didn't know that. And they thought maybe these changes were because of the environment those organisms were living in, but they weren't sure. But that was a, that's a pretty groundbreaking idea when you consider creationism. And Malthus, he came the closest, and in fact, Malthus and Darwin had a lot of the same ideas. Malthus, organisms compete, they fight for resources, food, water, a place to live. And those with favorable traits will live longest. What do we mean by favorable traits? Right over here, remember? We got that muscle protein that lets us jump higher and run faster. So those organisms with the favorable traits, with those genetic mutations that allow them to live better, live longer, they're going to survive. Let's talk about an example of that, a real-world example. In Europe, hundreds of years ago, and they might still be there, I don't know, we have the story of the peppered moth. 
and the peppered moths come in two flavors, white and black, or dark and light. And if you're a dark colored moth sitting on a tree with light colored bark, you will be easy to see and the birds will come and eat you. So it, that gene that makes the moth dark, as you can imagine, that's a gene that will disappear sooner or later if all of the dark moths are eaten. However, this is what happened. The Industrial Revolution happened in Europe. And over a number of years, the, there was a lot of pollution. And the trees became covered with grime and pollution from the factories. Now, all of a sudden, it's a good thing to be a dark-colored moth. Because now, the tree bark is dark-colored. You blend in. And now, the light moths who have that gene that makes them come out light, are the ones getting eaten. Fascinating. So now there's a lot more dark moths, right? Because most of the white ones will be getting eaten. So this is an example of an organism adapting to its environment. If the genes that make it dark, if all those genes are gone because all those moths are eaten, there will be largely light colored moths. But if the gene that makes this one light colored helps it to get killed faster, then there will be more dark moths. So interesting, changing organisms in response to the environment. So Darwin gets on a ship, five years he spends. Now you have to understand the times, 1800s. Nobody has planes, trains, automobiles. If you're going anywhere, you're walking, you're on a horse, or you're on a ship. So imagine growing up in one place, never leaving there, and then getting on a boat and going tens of thousands of miles away. Darwin saw things that blew his mind. Birds that didn't fly. Lizards that swim. Crazy stuff. He started to ask himself, could these life forms, these organisms, be different in different parts of the world because the environment is having an effect on that organism? The answer is yes. So again, if we're talking about the North Pole, you're not going to see uh, lions and tigers. They don't like it where it's cold. But at the North Pole, you are going to see penguins and polar bears. And they have the blubber, the genes, the proteins that give their bodies the blubber or the fur so that they can live in that environment. So again, Darwin's the first one to kind of put it all together that the environment shapes or has an effect on what the organism looks like. Does the environment affect which alleles, which genes stay or go? So we call this inheritance with modification. You are inheriting genes and they're being modified. <coughs> Excuse me. Here's one of the things Darwin saw that was pretty cool. He uh, sailed the Galapagos Islands. And you might have heard of that before. On the left, you see a turtle from one of the islands. Notice the short neck here, very short neck. Also notice the ground here, really wet, lots of grass, good yummy food. 
And then over here, picture of a turtle on another one of the Galapagos Islands. This one's got a super long neck and it's a lot drier there, a lot less vegetation and food. So here's a perfect example of modification depending on the environment, gene mutations that allow that organism to have a longer neck so it can reach up and get food that's up there. He's got to scrounge around more, whereas this guy, he's got hometown buffet. He's just got to put his face right down in there and he's eating food. He doesn't need a big long neck. He doesn't have to go work that hard. So perfect example of the environment in which an organism lives has an effect on what that organism looks like and what it can do. Darwin was also famous for noticing the different birds, the finches on the Galapagos Islands, lots of different beak shapes, different beak shapes and different feet. And so that was another thing he documented really well was how the finches had different beaks and and uh, claws. Take a look at another video. Uh, this lady is going to talk about this modification, descent, inheritance with modification, where we're inheriting genes that if they allow us to survive in the environment very well, those genes are going to stay around. If those genes don't allow us to survive in the environment, they're going to be gone. Let's take a look. The captioning is poor. There is a transcript, a typed transcript of this video on Canvas. Okay, so Darwin stringing these big ideas together. Hey, life forms do change over time. Hey, Organisms do change in response to their environment. He didn't know how. We didn't know about DNA and all of that stuff in 1800, but he, his next idea, which we think is a good one, maybe there's one organism, one type of organism, one species from which all of these different life forms came from. And we call that the common ancestor. So this is a, a very famous picture of Darwin's notebook. He thought of life as a tree with a, a, the common ancestor. You see, this is a number one, the common ancestor at the trunk of the tree. And his idea is, you know, over time, we got to all of these different organisms over here. See, he wrote, I think. So. This was Darwin's idea, this idea of a common ancestor. We all come from one organism. Now, some people are really into this stuff. I was doing research for this lecture, and I found that online. I thought it was wild. You see the, uh, the look at that. This is the, from the notebook right there, tattooed on the guy's chest. This is Darwin, and you may have seen this uh, type of picture before, and this is the idea that, of course, uh, from apes comes man. And very interesting. So here it is, what you've all been waiting for, Darwin's two theories, the theory of evolution and the theory of natural selection. The theory of evolution states that all species, the different types of living organisms, different species, all species on Earth today are descendants, came from, a single common ancestor. And all of the species we have today represent millions of years of these evolutionary changes. Remember, he didn't know about genes, so he didn't know how. We know now it's because of genes, gene mutations, but um, that's what Darwin thought. Here's another quick example. Here's a, a gene just I put in random letters. Let's say it makes a green pigment in maybe a frog or something like that. And the organism looks green. 
It's well camouflaged if it lives in the tree. Green leaves, green pigment, good to go. But what if there's a mutation and now the protein is a pigment molecule? And what if it's brown now? And again, the organism looks brown. It's going to be easily seen in the green leaves. Predators are going to kill it. And no good to have that gene mutation. Okay, natural selection was Darwin's other theory. And the theory of natural selection, it might sound like these are the same thing, but it again, it's a little different. Evolution just means all species on Earth came from one species. Natural selection is that... Natural selection favors organisms that are best adapted to a particular environment at a particular time. So these mutations are random, natural selection, nature's just selecting whatever's going to happen. But natural selection is the best when organisms have the genes, the proteins that are best adapted to the environment at that particular time. And as you saw in the example with the peppered moth, if the environment changes, then the traits, the gene mutations needed to survive in that environment might be different. Okay. Not everyone's happy about evolution. I found this also, and I just, little humor, little bioscience nerd humor. Okay, let's keep moving. So again, one more time, common ancestor right here with the C. This is time over time. Here's today. You see animals, reptiles, arthropods, mammals. There's humans right there. Plants. And again, the idea is over billions of years, genetic mutations have resulted in things like jaws, nervous systems, feathers, external skeletons, things like bugs, seeds in plants. So again, common ancestor. So you might be asking yourself, what is the common ancestor? What did we all come from? And there it is right there, everybody, your great granddaddy of them all. And these are stromatolites. What are we talking about? Actually, you're not looking at, you know, animals there. Those are, they're, they're rocks, but what they really are, if you zoom in and zoom in and zoom in and zoom in is you have these little living organisms. They're microscopic bacteria and they just kind of grow on top of their dead, you know, ancestors and they kind of grow upward toward the light under from under the water and so what you're seeing is of course thousands hundreds of thousands millions of years of bacteria from the bottom growing up toward the light so that is a stromatolite quick little video just to tell you so you could get a look at them but again these are not single organisms. This represents, again, they're microscopic bacteria. They live within these structures, and they're just growing for thousands and more years. Take a quick look. Okay, so in addition to, you know, talking about what did people think before Darwin came, and Darwin's two theories of evolution and natural selection. The other thing we really want you to focus on for at least the 
online quiz for this lecture is proof of evolution. So what's the proof of all this? How do we know this for sure? And again, humans have been around a very, very tiny sliver of time in the whole scope of time, but we think we have, we biologists think we have some good ideas that prove evolution happened. And we're going to talk about those and then we'll be done for today. The first is fossils. Fossils, we believe, is proof of evolution. The second is homologous and vestigial structures. Homologous and vestigial structures. And you might remember that word homologous from homologous chromosomes. And finally, biochemical proof or DNA. If every living thing is made of DNA, doesn't that mean we all came from the same thing? All right, I'm jumping the gun here. Let's talk about fossils. Fossils, everyone knows what fossils are. The remains of organisms that died in the ground over time, pressure from the earth and the rock, and you can usually see like the outline of the bones of, of an organism that died a long time ago. These are in uh, all cases, species that are no longer here, and so by comparing fossils to living organisms that are still alive, we have been able to piece together how, what evolved from what. Here is a great example. A modern whale, modern whale. Did you know that modern whales have hip bones? A hip bone. You can see a little piece of brown right there. That's a hip bone. Why on earth would a whale that doesn't have any legs have a hip bone? Well, what we found out is whales evolved from land animals. Fascinating. So Pachycetus is the name of a species that we believe the modern whale came from. Uh, notice the skull. All that happened from here to here are gene mutations that made different proteins that resulted in different shapes of skeletons and things like that. So we started with Pachycetus, who of course has hip bones because he walks. Then they found Ambulocetus, and this organism could do both, walked on land, but also swam, kind of like sea lions or seals. Walk on land, but could also swim. Then we got Rodhocetus, Rodhocetus, and this organism had reduced limbs, probably not walking anymore, probably swimming all the time, but maybe using them as like back flippers. And it says this one swam with that up and down motion like modern whales do. And so we have established these evolutionary chains where we can see what evolved from what evolved from what. And sometimes things are left over, like the hip bone in the modern whales. Homologous structures. This is very interesting. We are comparing anatomical traits of different organisms to see how body structures are different in different species. The example we're going to use is the forelimb, your arm, or the wing of a bird, or the paw of your puppy. So let's take a look. One of the interesting things we find in anatomy is that regardless of what the limb is used for, the bones are always in the same order. Notice, orange 
then blue and purple, then green, then pink, and then white. Notice how the colors are the same, whether we're talking about a bat, a bird, a dog, a human, it doesn't matter because the bones, and in us, those bones, humerus, ulna, radius, carpals, metacarpals, phalanges. You may have heard of these anatomy terms, but the idea behind homologous structures is even though there are modifications here for that organism to best survive in its environment, the structure of the bones, the placement of the bones is the same. Vestigial structures is a little different. This is the idea that you have a body trait that had a purpose in your ancestor, in your great, great, grand, way back millions of years. But that trait doesn't have any purpose in you. And there are a lot of examples in humans, structures of the body, traits, that had a purpose in our ancestors, but has no purpose today. Examples are that pelvic bone in the whale. The whale doesn't need it, but Pachycetus needed it. Appendix. Many of you maybe have had your appendix out. No use in humans, but we believe that back when we were apes living in the trees, eating plants, that the appendix helped us to digest that plant material. Now we eat meat, we don't need it, that's how we evolved. So we didn't need that structure to help us eat all the plants. Other examples are, you've all had goosebumps before, maybe that was, uh, uh, you know, had a purpose. You've seen cats get all puffed up like that. It's the same idea. These little muscles in their hair shafts are contracting, and that's what makes them look big and scary, and maybe the predator will run away instead of eating you. Same thing with these little structures in our ears. You know, we don't need to listen for the predators coming anymore. We live in a house. We can lock the door. Uh, things like that. But back then, we needed the structures, the ears, to hear the predators coming and run away. Wisdom teeth is another one. I know some of you have had your wisdom teeth out. Look at that. What could possibly be the purpose of having teeth all the way up there like that? All it does is cause us trouble. But again, back in the day when we weren't cooking our food, cutting up our food, uh, we were just eating it raw. We needed those teeth to be able to eat that stuff. So homologous and vestigial structures know what we're talking about and know the difference. And finally, biochemical proof. Of course, Darwin had no idea about DNA. Uh, we didn't realize that till 1953. Uh, but since then, we have compared the DNA sequences of many different species and find that some genes are present in large numbers of species, making the code, the DNA code, similar. For example, you remember in our cell lecture that the phospholipid bilayer of the plasma membrane. Remember that plasma membrane? Proteins with lipids. Well, where do you think those proteins come from? Thousands of proteins on the plasma membrane of every cell. And whether that's a plant cell or an animal cell, 
or the cell of a bacteria. They all need those proteins in the plasma membrane. So it makes sense that there are certain genes that are similar even though the organisms are very different. If you compare your DNA to another human, you're going to have the exact same genes. Those genes will be different because unless it's your twin, it's not going to be 100% exactly the same, but all the same genes. Uh, you compare uh, a human to a chimpanzee, 98% closest living species to humans, a mouse, 92% of the same genes you have and a mouse, a fruit fly. Is this crazy? Almost half of the same genes and even some plants, 18%. So if the DNA is the same, A's and T's and C's and G's, and if everyone's got proteins and protein synthesis and all that, then we all came from the same place. That's the idea behind evolution. Here's a video if you'd like to watch a little bit more about evolution, and this YouTube video will be posted, captioned, and posted for you. Well, you're watching it now, so you already know that. Okay, have a good evening.